Welcome to the podcast series, Reducing the Risk of Severe Illness for Patients with COVID-19. This podcast is part of a micro-learning library on the testing, diagnosis, and treatment of severe illness for patients with COVID-19. This education is brought to you by the France Foundation and supported by an educational grant from Pfizer. Listen as Dr. Alvaro Galvez, a Pediatric Infectious Disease Fellow at the University of California, Irvine, and Dr. Victor Cisneros, an emergency medicine physician attending at Eisenhower Hospital, discuss multi-inflammatory syndrome in children as it relates to COVID-19. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Dr. Alvarez Galvez here. We're going to talk about today COVID-associated multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, better known as MISI. Welcome, Dr. Galvez. It's a pleasure to have you on. Oh, hey, thank you so much. Appreciate it. So, you know, obviously this is a hot topic these days. Um, you know, me as, my, as an ER doc, you know, mainly see a lot of adults. We do see this in the emergency department, you know, with these kiddos. Most of these kiddos go home, but COVID is a hot topic right now. I think it's important for our providers to kind of know, especially in the outpatient world, in the emergency department world, kind of to know what to look for and how to identify this, how to like separate um, this from other diseases like Kawasaki's or, you know, other severe respiratory illnesses. I was hoping you can give us, we can start up with a little bit of background and then you can kind of give us some pointers on, on how to identify and what we should be looking for and possibly, you know, how do we differentiate the kids that need to go home and kids that uh, need to be admitted? Right. No, yeah. Pleasure. So it's very, it's very interesting phenomenon. So it was first identified around March 2020 at the height of the alpha wave of COVID. Uh, it was reported in the UK. So they noted all these kids coming in with severe illness requiring uh, PICU admissions. Uh, they came varied with prolonged fever, sore throats, headaches, a lot of GI symptoms. And most notably was all the inflammatory markers were elevated, CRP, neutrophils. They had high ferritin levels. And the big topic, of course, uh, was that it was all associated with a recent SARS-CoV-2 infection about four to six weeks of time. Now, the case definition eventually developed over, you know, the next couple of months until uh, in May 2020, CC finally came out with the advisory as defined as being a kid under age of 21 years old, having uh, inflammatory evidence. Um, so you can talk about, like I said, your CRP, your ESR being very elevated, having some sort of multi-system. Remember, this is a multi-system inflammation. So we're not just talking about fevers. We're talking about cardiac issues. Do you have elevated troponins? Do we have acute renal failure? Do we have um, GI disturbances? And so you have to associate two of those and as well, being able to rule out any alternative diagnosis. Uh, as you mentioned from the EED world, you're going to think about Kawasaki's, you're going to be thinking about sepsis workup because you don't know, these kids are usually shocky. The worst ones are usually shocky and hypotensive. Oh, that's great. I think that's that's amazing uh, little background that and, and information to look for. You know, obviously we see a lot of kiddos in the emergency department. From my experience, most of them go home, like 95, 98% of them, even the ones that are COVID and you know, obviously it's it's not a black and white picture. It's, there's a lot of gray zone. So we appreciate these pointers. What are a couple things to look for if you had to pick a couple things that would differentiate these kiddos from, besides the inflammatory markers, a couple clinical pictures. Obviously, Kawasaki's, we look for the conjunctivitis, the, you know, the discomation in the skin, the fissures in the lips, the strawberry tongue, you know, the classic medical school things that we look for. But what other things should be we looking for clinically that can kind of be red flags for us? It's interesting because there's some overlap with Kawasaki. So you actually do see also a lot of times bilateral conjunctivitis. But the big differences, I would say, is usually uh, these kids that come more with either increased hypertension, more of a shock-like syndrome. Uh, a lot of them have been mistaken for uh, having an acute appendicitis, like very bad abdominal pain, right lower quadrant with the bilateral conjunctivitis and no known other symptoms. And of course, the history of getting COVID-2 uh, recently. Of course, now that we COVID spread more, the way you think about it is, and the way that I tell the primary care physicians to talk about it is discuss it, ask whether they have had a URI type picture, you know, four to six weeks ago, rather than have you been COVID positive, uh, since a lot of people are not getting tested these days. 
Um, and overall, the picture is also less likely to have much, much more um, of the rash. But overall, it's just this picture of it feels like you're in shock, but there's you can't explain why a, a healthy immunocompetent patient will be on some sort of septic shock like picture. That's very interesting. Now, let's say, is fever a good marker? Say a kiddo, you know, normally from my experience and a lot of the research show that a lot of kid, once they start a documented real fever of 100.4 or above, greater than four days, that's usually, for me, at least in the emergency department, obviously in the with the clinical picture, if the kid looks sick, I'm going to start labbing them up. Most kids, as you know, most kids in the emergency department, we don't get labs. You know, most kids' upper respiratory infections are very common. You know, colds, URIs are very common. UTIs are very common. GI bugs are very common. A lot of these kids go home with proper hydration as long as they're eating well, peeing, pooping well, they look well clinically, and they have no major vital abnormalities. So most of them go home. But I start, you know, from a, as a humble ER doc, I start kind of worrying when a kid, when the mom's like, he's had a fever of five days without a clear source. Um, should we, you know, start ordering some labs and start considering this in our differential these days? I think so. And it's very interesting you mentioned the five days because the five days originally came out of the Kawasaki's criteria. You know, it's, it's usually, we always think about med school, our algorithm, five days of fever. Most viral syndromes that go away about two or three days and then the, the fever kind of goes away. But it's interesting, the CDC has changed it that you do not need the five days of fever to be a MIS-C. Uh, really, their definition has been like one day of really long, high fevers, uh, associate and having the prior history of COVID exposure, which is very broad based overall just to capture patients. So what I would say uh, is usually if you don't have a known source, and usually these kids, it's very interesting, these kids will not have URI symptoms. So if they're less than five days of fevers, but they're coming with no URI symptoms, high fevers, um, maybe they have a slightly headache, they have abdominal pain, that's when you start worrying that this might be Miss C. Uh, more than anything else. And particularly, the age group I think about is a little bit outside of the Kawasaki. So Kawasaki, you think about your two to five-year-olds, maybe uh, even a little bit younger. Usually, the over, but when it comes to Miss C, you really talk about that school age. So you think about less than 13 years old, higher than five years old. So that, that sweet spot is really the one that's the big warning sign for us. Now, if we're suspecting this, what kind of labs? You know, normally I would order, you know, CBC, you know, BMP, CRP, or, uh, you know, inflammatory markers, ferritin. These are the classic ones that we would order in adults too. You know, coags, possibly a BNP, because I know these kids have cardiac issues and maybe a troponin. We rarely order troponins in kiddos, you know. But I think this is this one of the, you know, uh, patient population that we would consider ordering some of these cardiac enzymes because I know they have a lot of cardiac risk factors, you know, similar to Kawasaki's kids. Correct. So that's been very interesting coming from the pediatric world because I was not used to interpreting troponins. Like, why would I? Kids don't need troponin levels. But this has been a big indicator. Even my Miss C tends to have some sort of elevation of the troponin levels, which helps us really differentiate from Kawasaki's. Kawasaki's tends to have more of a coronary aneurysm type involvement, so their troponin levels tend to usually be normal. But on it's an overall inflammation of the heart as opposed to just the coronary arteries when it comes to Miss C. So that's where your troponins come up. Um, so that's been helping me distinguish it. The other ones, like you said, a CBC is fantastic. Usually what, what uh, anybody can look at this. And I would say, look at that differential. The big important ones that I'm looking for is, unlike Kawasaki's, Kawasaki's, we think about uh, plate levels of over 450,000. When you think about Miss C, you think about thrombocytopenias uh, with inflammation. So it's really interesting. Uh, so you have thrombocytopenias and you have significant lymphopenia. So when I see that combination, thrombocytopenia, lymphopenia, elevated CRP and a ferritin, yeah, I love my coax and my BMP, but at least right away, I'm always thinking this got to be it hating me towards Miss C. The last portion that we can talk about is treatment. You know, what do we do once we identify these kiddos? You know, do we start IVIG in the emergency department? Do we start steroids? What's what's the, you know, uh, what do we do in this setting? Fantastic question. I think if you have a hypotensive patient, uh, in my experience, and, you know, I, I mean, I'm treated already like 70 of these kids, usually I my preference and what the most guidelines say, go ahead and give the first dose of steroids. Give them a steroid load followed by your IVIG. Um, you'll see the literature recently talk about going back and forth IVIG versus steroids, but that combination 
for your run-of-the-mill MISC has been proven to be fairly effective and turn them off within three days. Um, so once you identify them, give that first dose of steroids, usually about two milligrams per kg uh, methylprednisone, followed by two grams of IVIG. That's amazing. So th- that's great. And obviously these kids are going to be treated as shocky. If they're shocked, we just do the r- normal protocol, you know, sepsis kind of fluids, epinephrine, and then consider IVIG and steroids. Any take home points just to wrap this episode up three things that you think we should kind of look out for and uh, take uh, recommendations that you would give us. I think the big thing we need to think about first is how to identify these kids in the community. Um, so you're coming in with a kid that has had a history of a URI symptoms and make sure if they've been febrile and you don't see any other obvious causes to go ahead and send them to the ED. Once in the ED as an ED doc, I would say the big thing is make sure it's a school age kid. Uh, immunocompetence is the big thing, and most likely a history of not being vaccinated. Vaccines have been shown to reduce the rate of MMISC by more than a hundredfold, the difference between the two. So if they're not vaccinated, that's probably your likely bet. And then testing, as always, make sure we get the, the first set of labs to get started get identifying that this is messy. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Galvez. It's a pleasure having you. Hopefully we can have you back again. Yeah, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Earn CME by clicking the link for credit. And be sure to check out the other podcast episodes in the library.